today, I am very excited. We have our consult member, Rebecca, presenting for us. Um, and Rebecca, I'll let you introduce yourself as I get the slides. Okay. Hi, everyone. And I'm seeing um, Dr. Corey Goldberg, who was the person who actually, hi, who um, told me about this consult group. Um, so that feels really lovely to see you. And um, thank you to everyone who is, you know, able to turn on their camera. I understand we're not always resourced enough to do that, but it does help me to sort of feel a sense of the relationality of the space, if that's possible for you. Um, so my name is Rebecca Francesca Cariotti. Um, I am a licensed acupuncturist, herbalist, um, queer, non-binary parent, and um, I am in group practice now in on um, Abenaki territories in both Bristol and Burlington, Vermont. Um, my practice is called um, Refuge Acupuncture and Somatics, um, and I use they, them pronouns. Recently, um, I grew the practice and um, hired a really awesome um, licensed social worker um, who works from a somatic lens actually is training in brain spotting, which is very cool. Um, and the reason that I'm sharing with you that this is a multimodality practice, and you can forward the slides, Ellie, thank you, um, is because I'm here to talk about a very particular way of, of rendering and looking at and practicing East Asian medicine. Um, which is the umbrella term for really acupuncture, Chinese herbal medicine, um, energetic movement, and something called shi liao, which is um, basically using using food to help address um, a, a client or patient's concerns. You can go to the next practice. Next slide, thank you. Um, and what I was noticing as I was as, I'm, as I was practicing, um, and the focus of the practice is really on, you know, working with folks um, who are harmed by, by systems, um, particularly queer, transgender, nonconforming, and neurodiverse people. And I also included that children, because uh, even though, um, even though a, a child may not be identifying with one of those um, communities, there is a way in which children are, are defying these categories that we stamp on to human beings. And I, I feel that as a practitioner, a somatic practitioner, who's really invested in, in liberatory practice that including children and, and sort of intervening quote unquote early on can help to um, either mediate or maybe even help parents to sort of buffer their children from, um, from the impacts of these systems. Next slide, please, Ellie. Um, so why I'm here, I believe and I practice um, East Asian medicine um, as a profound form of mental health care. And I think that um, by understanding how we can work together as, as um, practitioners who are dedicated to neurodiversity and gender affirming care for the full lifespan, we can make a really profound impact um, in the lives of our communities and clients. And I think that um, East Asian medicine is actually inherently destigmatizing of mental, um, mental health. Um, it's actually inherently inclusive of neurodiversity and it's inherently gender affirming. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Ellie. And so I'm here to basically explain to you why and how that is. Um, East Asian medicine doesn't, doesn't separate mental, physical, and spiritual health. It's literally all the same. 
And so in a certain way, we can talk about, um, a, a patient can talk about their mental health, physical health experience in a more global integrated manner. And we actually can, can reinforce that because we understand that the function of say, or the state of the blood in the body can have a real impact both on um, one's ability to stay asleep, fall asleep, think clearly, concentrate, um, have enough energy to go about the day so that you can see that like in what I just shared with you, there are um, portions of mental health, this, this box that we have created um, in dominant culture, and there are portions of physical health, right? Energy levels um, and uh, sleep patterns or difficulties. East Asian medicine is also highly, highly contextual. And so meaning when, when we're looking to understand what's happening with a person, not unlike um, mental health professionals such as yourself, we are, we are looking at the entire, all the concentric circles that are surrounding a person, meaning we're looking at their sort of their life routines and habits. We're looking at their family life. We're looking at um, their work and school schedules. We're looking at what's happening in community. We're looking at what, how um, global and national um, events impact the mental, physical, and, and spiritual like machinations of a person. So there's a way in which there is like a built-in understanding within East Asian medicine of the social determinants of health. So we... And, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying, unfortunately, that every acupuncturist or East Asian medicine practitioner um, has had the training experience or lived experience to sort of um, decouple some of the, some of the um, really harmful pathologizing um, aspects of the medicine, of Western medical models from East Asian medicine, because unfortunately it really has been infiltrated um, East Asian medicine has been infiltrated with fat phobia, with, um, you know, um, neurotypical understandings of what is like pathological and not. It really, it, it, there, are, there are a lot of um, classist um, assumptions that are made and not picked apart and not understood. But what I'm trying to present here is that at its core and for practitioners who are really dedicated to unlearning um, systems of oppression and unlearning systems of oppression in their practice, in their, in their work with people, either in one-on-one -on -one sessions or in, in group, um, this medicine has enormous potential to um, be really liberatory on a lot of different levels. Um, also, in, in um, Western dominant culture, you might think of yin and yang as a binary, but it's actually not a binary at all. It's, it's a concept that is deeply embedded in um, relationality. Like there, there literally is no yin without yang. There is no such thing. And there also, yin is not a cis woman, Yang is not a cis male. Every single human being needs the um, needs a balance of yin and yang in order to live and to thrive. And so they're built into this concept of like how we understand the body, how we understand nature. Um, there is this understanding that there is a dynamic balance that shifts between yin and yang and it is a it is a spectrum not a binary next slide please there's also no such thing in east asian medicine 
as ADHD, PTSD, complex PTSD, panic attacks, ASD, sensory processing disorder. There's no such thing. We don't evaluate the body in that way. And we don't label people in that way. And I know a lot of you are working in like radical mental health um, framework. So I'm not, I'm not making accusations here. I want that to be clear. I just, I want you to understand that we can, practitioners in East Asian medicine who are under, who are interested in liberatory practice and working with neurodiverse folks and working with queer folks and working with gender non-conforming folks, we have an amazing toolkit to use to work in tandem with you um, to help your to help your clients to to thrive really next slide please so if we don't if we don't if there is no such thing as like asd or adhd or sensory processing disorder in east asian medicine like how do we how do we address it how do we understand it how do we treat it so before i dive very deep into that i just want to say that like y'all know this no two people's mental or physical health experiences are the same, right? So like when a person comes to you and you're doing an intake um, and they, you know, they're saying like, I have anxiety. Like you actually don't know what that means, right? Because there's, there are so many different presentations of anxiety. There are so many different presentations of ASD. Like it would be ridiculous to be like, oh, you have anxiety. Okay. You know, let's like dive right into addressing it. Like, obviously y'all know that, but we also know that. <laughs> and this is how we deal with that. Next slide, please. Um, we do something called pattern differentiation. And so when we look at the pattern, that pattern or combined patterns that are causing a person to have a concern that they're coming to us with, these are, this is like the short list. This is not um, ex extensive actually, this is not all of it. These are the things that we look at when we're trying to understand the root cause of what is causing this person to suffer. So we're not trying to, and this is where like the neurodiverse diversity celebrating and affirming piece of this medicine really comes in. We're not trying to fix people. We're not trying to make their neurodiversity go away. We're not trying to fit people into gendered categories. We're actually trying to understand the root cause or causes because as we get older sometimes patterns will combine and mesh and things get a little bit more complicated right you probably see that it, it's generally speaking the younger you you work with somebody the quicker and less complicated it is to unravel things not always but a lot of the time so here what we're what we're taking into consideration it, are those concentric circles so the first, like basically the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So basically from the client's descriptions of concerns all the way to their family health history, that impacts the state of their blood, body fluids, digestion, energy, and body temperature. And these like building blocks of health and wellness are what we're trying to understand, like what's happening with them. And to understand, if we understand better what's happening with them, we can address the, the whole range of um, quote unquote, mental, physical, and spiritual aspects of what is going on with them. Next slide, please. So what that might look like. So I'm, I'm, 
not going to explain all of this slide to you right now, but what I am, what I am going to, this is demonstrative of the, the different patterns. These are all patterns. Running piglet cheek is a pattern. So why does running piglet cheek, what, what do we think running piglet cheek might be? It's in the anxiety category, just to help. Give it a whirl. Seriously, it's it's really, it's what it sounds like. Okay, running piglachi is um, this feeling of like a rush that comes from the lower abdomen or the pelvis all the way up the, the, the belly and the chest into the face. That's what running piglachi is. That's a manifestation of anxiety, right? And so we'll go even deeper. Why is this person having this running piglet chi? Because it's chi in those vessels, that's the, um, it's the ren or the stomach vessel, meridian, um, it's supposed to go that way, right? So a lot of the times when we're, when we're, we see a running piglet chi uh, manifestation of anxiety with people, we're also noticing that there are digestive concerns. There might be reflux see, coming up. There might be, there might be um, not enough fluids to anchor the chi and yin in in the vessels. So it's um, it's deficient. So there is a rush upwards because there's not enough to anchor it down in this direction. So you can see. You can see belching, you can see um, even headaches, you can see dizziness from that, from that upward movement. So basically understanding the state of the person with the concentric circles and then the building blocks of qi, yin, blood, and yang can help us really understand manifestations of mental health experiences and the physical sequelae if you will. Next slide, please. Um, this is a really quick presentation of this because I want to have, I want to have um, room for questions, but what I'm, what I hope that you would take away from this, and I'm going to do some case um, studies in a second, is that every pattern presentation is different. Um, and we have the room and the complexity within East Asian medicine to understand the complexity and to address the complexity from the physical to the energetic to the spirit level. In this medicine, there is absolutely no separation of mental and physical pattern differentiation. So inherently, we're going to say to someone, oh yes, you know, we can we can do something to resolve that, moderate that, help that, you know, be relieved. Like there, there is rarely a situation that a person with a mental health concern, unless they're like, honestly being, unless they, they have unsafe behaviors towards themselves or others, even in that, even in that case, there are, there are practitioners who are more equipped with the infrastructure to address that. So what I'm saying is like, there's always something to do because there's a reason, there's a pattern, there's a root to every single presentation. So you just have to figure out what the root is, then you can address it. Um, and, then a, and then a fourth thing that I, for some reason forgot to say here is that um, acupuncture does not require the use of, of needles or pins, um, it just requires the proper tools and training. So in my practice, I have a brick and mortar practice, which is refuge acupuncture and somatics, and that's here on Abenaki territories in Vermont. I use microcurrent, which just mimics the piezoelectricity that moves up and down the fascial lines. It's super low sensation. For folks that need like you know, stronger, firmer sensation. I do, um, I'm doing this um, because it's a, an herbal compress that has like a handle and like a bulb. I should have brought one. And I can do herbal compress massage on different meridians. That works really well for some folks that need 
deeper, firmer um, sensory input. Um, I use medical grade lasers, which look just like laser pens that you play with your cat with. <laughs> um, they're super low sensation. I also have pins that are literally smaller, or not smaller, what's the word? Thinner than um, a strand, a single strand of hair. I'm also trained in how to like trick the body into like noticing sensation at a different area when a pin is put in, if that's um, what, what the patient has consented to. Um, so I also want you to take away that you don't have to have needles or pins as I call them because they're a very different instrument than the hypodermic needle that you would use in more of a Western medical setting. You don't have to use those in order to benefit from acupuncture. Um, and um, I have a telehealth practice. I don't use them as much in my, in my um, brick and mortar practice here, but I have a telehealth practice where we use phototherapy patches. They're like this big and I teach people to palpate their bodies and they put them on their body. But if that doesn't feel good, we can put it on clothing like above the point. So let's say the point is here, it would go on the clothing inside and then nobody would see it. Um, and it uses the infrared light that everybody's body emits in order to activate acupuncture points. So that's another great way to work with folks who either are, you know, just sensory wise, like pins wouldn't work, or maybe even in terms of just like being in the same room, being touched, or even the possibility of being touched by somebody is really not within their wheelhouse. I, I do work with people um, virtually in that way. And then they walk around with a with an acupuncture treatment. It's actually very cool. And there's a way in which through that process, they're able to develop more interoception um, and have honestly like just a slowly healing relationship with, with the soma, with the body. Next slide, please. Um, I think I'll do one case study so that we have time. Um, so these are real people I've worked with. Can you go to the next slide, Ellie, please? Um, they've given consent for me to present to you and to use their own words. Um, so you you can look here. There, This person is a mental health counselor, um, and she is a cisgendered woman in her early 40s, um, white body, very smart, very heart-centered, service and justice focused. Um, she has a complex neurological past um, it, um, with brain injury. I didn't put that here. Um, she has some diagnoses of ADHD, PTSD. Um, she's survived uh, multiple terminal illnesses and she has fibromyalgia. Um, next slide. She um, came in because she was having a PTSD flare which was triggered by a COVID infection. Um, and this was, it was really not good that she was having trouble walking because of the vertigo that was constant all day long. Um, Hypervigilance, she was really having trouble falling asleep. She was had, had numbness in her hands. Um, she was really, really low energy. Her digestion was, was really not great with loose stool nausea all the time and her vision was was getting pretty blurred. Next slide, please. Um, so first what we did is some home care practices because I usually meet people for an intake over telehealth and I give them some things to do right away. So we did some um, grounding exercises for the nervous system. I talked about the importance of rest, especially for her eyes, because I could see that part of what was going on was her liver blood. Um, and I'm not going to explain all of this, but I'm just, I want to give you a little taste of like how we think her liver blood was exhausted. So the, um, liver blood nourishes the eyes. Um, and that's part of what was happening with the, the blurred vision. Um, I helped her to think about cooked and warm food, cooked and warm food helps to helps with digestion writ large, but it also helps with the assimilation of food, which creates blood. Um, making sure that she's drinking, um, 
room temperature, warm water, not to tax the digestive system anymore than it was. Next slide, please. So for the first treatment, we cleared chi that was going the wrong way. Um, basically, there's a, there's a cycle of chi that's in a circle and it goes like this. And sometimes when there, it, there's trauma or there's a PTSD flare or there's serious illness, which were all present in this particular um, patient's experience, um, the chi starts to go in the wrong direction. Um, so that's when you see things going awry in a person's system. So we put pins on either side of her, um, of her spine on the big ropey muscles on either side, very, very shallowly inserted. She rested. Um, we reinforced the heart um, with an in and out pin at the wrist. And that was treatment number one. Next slide, please. After that, we, um, we did a, a basically like a trauma clearing treatment, um, which was basically to help vent, these are Chinese medicine terms, to vent some of these experiences um, and help her system to like reorganize after um, not just poor thing, she had, she both had the PTSD, PTSD flare. And then between treatments one and two, she had another medically traumatic event. Um, so it was, there was a lot of compounding factors for this person. Next slide, please. Um, so eight treatments, so six treatments later, um, her vertigo and dizziness were completely resolved. Um, what she called her anxiety highway was gone. I um, mean, it was very much like running piglet sheet. It was actually, she described it as a, this kind of feeling. Um, she was having regular bowel movements. Her cognitive function improved significantly. Um, her blurry vision was beginning to correct. It wasn't totally resolved. That usually takes longer. Um, her energy was still on the lower side, but it was steadily increasing. And she was able to feel her hands again. Um, I'm not going to go through this case study, but if you could go to the very last slide, Ellie, please. Um, I'm going to have, there's going to be time for, for questions very shortly, but I do want to let you know, um, if you are outside of Vermont and you are a patient, you think might, um, benefit from the, from my approach, um, Spectrum Chinese Medicine is my telehealth practice and you can check that out. But more importantly, I would say, um, I'm hiring a, a therapist, um, at Refuge, um which is the multimodality somatics practice. Um, for the right person, um, I would totally be happy to um, work remotely with someone only. And um, in Vermont, there's uh, something called an interim telehealth license, which is extremely easy to get for folks who are mental health counselors, licensed LCSWs, LMCHC, whatever it is. Um, in other states, it's like a 20 minute process. <laughs> so that's why I can sort of cast this net a little bit farther. Um, the position is um, a full time position for 25 hours of work a week. Um, and it's W2. So um, you don't have to worry about all the self employment taxes. And it's a true group practice. We do we we offer you know, bi-monthly supervision and, and full staff consults together. And we do training on um, trauma transformational practices that cross modalities. Um, so please, if you, if you know of folks who are aligned um, and might be looking for um, a group practice experience that's really built to be sustainable for all of us, I would so appreciate if you would share that with people that you know. I'm not a therapist, so I don't have those networks. Thank you, Well, I'd love to hear your questions and reflections. I do have a question, but actually, is it possible to put the slides back up? Because I don't, I was going to take actually a picture of the slide, <laughs> and then I didn't, and I should have, because now I don't remember everything that was on it. Um, there we go. Okay, clients going, yes, this one right here, the pattern. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in reading this, um, is it kind of requiring someone to be pretty insightful 
um, regarding even like their concerns or be able to describe like their work life and school life. Cause I know uh, I do a lot of in-home work. And so if I ask someone to describe me like their home life, what I see and what they share, or even I guess their perspective of it, they're, it's just sometimes so different. Yeah. That's a really great question. So I would say no, because we're also looking at their tongue, which is a map, which is basically a map of the internal organs, the state of the fluids in the chi. It's very, very revealing. Um, we also, you know, you generally, with, with the exception of telemedicine, we tend to work where we live. And so if we have a sense of people's experiences that are not necessarily our own, or we share lived experience with our clients, which is a, is true for, for me and, and the um, clinician that's on the team, we can kind of infer. It's like, okay, I, I know where, I see your address, I know where you live, heard a little bit from you about, you know, the food that you eat, you know, it, it's, it, it's not necessarily that hard, especially when you're working in, in affinity with, with communities that you are a part of. Um, I would also say for people that I see in person, I take their pulse um, okay. at the wrist, it's just that. It, and it's, it's very telling. It's okay. very, very telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about for the, like, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, is that kind of just like a conversation and seeing if they know, are they aware? It's both. So like there are people, a lot of people think, and this is a, this is an old understanding of pain management that if it's, if it hurts, you put ice on it. Mm -hmm. And actually Western medicine has debunked that many years ago, but most doctors are not reading the literature, so they don't know. So they keep telling people to ice, ice, ice. For, for injuries that, and this might be a little cryptic, but for injuries that are hot in nature, because there's thermal nature to pain, mm -hmm. right? Think about like, uh, The difference between the pain that you have when you spend a lot of time outside um, in like a cold, damp environment and how that feels versus um, if you were to overwork a muscle and, it, and have a little bit of a burning sensation, that's kind of like more of a hot mm -hmm. pain. So you're, the first one where you're out in the cold and damp, would it would be better with heat with a hot water bottle the second the second one would probably be better with no temperature or maybe even initially after the acute event might be better with cold or, or um, cool there's also like a lot of your patients do, your, your client doesn't really need to be super insightful like they can tell you like I feel really overwhelmed with a lot of noise what makes it better earphones you know or you see them wearing earphones or you you know you have them in your office and they come they put them on every time so it's like there's a there's a mixture in this medicine really of like the self-reported information which are called signs and then things that the clinician is trained to observe. It's a very okay. observational medicine in a lot of ways. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for presenting when you were sharing. And this is a very new, different concept for me um, from the lens that I was trained in. But when you were sharing, I was just thinking how affirming this could be for many autistic clients who often report, it's frustrating to me when people ask me, what am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? Because it's hard to identify and it's hard to communicate that in language that the other person or that the provider understands. And so I'm just thinking about how this model could feel really affirming. And then also how so many of our clients have a lot of medical trauma, especially um, like autistic femmes who have had 
their comorbid symptoms very dismissed in the medical system. Um, but I, I was, I'm wondering if you could help me understand when I'm meeting with a client, when would I identify this client would really benefit from going to see an acupuncturist? And then how would I explain that to my clients? Hmm. So I would say like, I don't know if this is a word that y'all use, but like stubborn symptoms or just things that just like, they're just not, they're just really um, impacting the quality of their life and they're not changing. Um, so that could be anything from, you know, I know a lot of autistic folks have like digestive challenges um that's digestion is squarely within our wheelhouse um helping with helping with sleep regulation helping with just like nervous system regulation overall so whether or not we're talking about a down regulated system or a system or an up regulated system um I've had, I mean, I've had a lot of success with ARFID, actually, um, just to expand the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And how I would explain it, um, and this is how I, this is like when I refer my patients to a therapist or the, the clinical social worker that's on my team, I just say that like, we all need like a tapestry of support like we are we are living in a incredibly violent <laughs> and like you know your clients so you know the words that would resonate with them but like this is a very violent culture um a, you know that that really targets people who have any kind of quote-unquote difference um and the fact of the matter is, is that, like, the vectors of oppression are impacting our mental, physical, and spiritual health in a very profound way every single minute of every day. Um, and it is not a personal failure to be impacted by that, you know? And so having, having, you know, different lenses on and different support people working on the same system is, is just another, is just another way to have a stronger support tapestry or basket or web or whatever metaphor you want to use. I really, I really like to normalize this. Um, and you know, if you, if you have a person who is really into like the evidence base, then now I have a lot of beef with like how, you know, the evidence base is, you know, approaches this medicine, which doesn't understand pattern differentiation because you can't replicate it because not everybody's anxiety or sensory differences is from the same root cause. So, you know, there's a lot of, and so a lot of the research, I will just warn you, a lot of the research around autism and acupuncture is very much from like a behavior change standpoint, which is kind of gross, but there's also, there are also pieces of it that are like, oh, folks are sleeping better. Folks are, you know, better regulated in their nervous system. Folks are feeling better in terms of like pain patterns and like, you know, tension in the body. That's great. Um, and can have profound impacts on just the ease and the joy of being a human living in this body every day. Is that helpful? So when helpful. like wanting to refer someone or looking for someone, because we're obviously not all near you, <laughs> um, like what would we look for? Because I, I mean, I have made referrals before for whether it's acupuncture or whatever it is. And it, I'm, I work with a lot of autistic clients too. And sometimes yeah. it just goes extremely bad. Um, and then I feel horrible because then it, it's like ruled out. Like I'll never see a person like that again. And I'm like, no, yeah. no, no. It's just, they just didn't know um, how to work with someone that was, you know, autistic or they didn't know how to work with someone, you know, that maybe 
couldn't express how they felt um, or the interoception and stuff like that. So how, right. how do you find someone that has the experience or like, is there certain things you'd look for? Is there certain trainings that you'd specifically have that I'd be like, oh, this person like would be good? It's a really good question. I wish I could tell you that there were more of us out there. Um, at the risk of, of sounding self-congratulatory, like honestly me, um, through the, through the, um, through Spectrum Chinese Medicine. However, I, I invite you <laughs> to um, email me to be like, here's where I am. This is what I need. I'll try to find somebody. It's a little bit, um, so this whole idea of like sensory inclusive acupuncture is, is as far as I can see is something that I kind of coined, believe it or not. Like I feel a little ridiculous, but, um, but I think that's true. But I do know like anecdotally, for instance, the person that I, um, that I get my, my herbal compresses from, I know that she has training or like sensitivity in terms of like neurodiversity. Um, but I have, I have a network of acupuncturists that I can put things out to. So seriously, if a person doesn't want to see someone virtually, if they, or if they don't feel resonant with the way that I explain my stuff on the website, like email me, I'm going to put my email here and I'll try to find the person, um, an acupuncturist. I, I'm really interested in this becoming more mainstream, um, amongst acupuncturists because I think, and I see every day how this medicine is so impactful and it's like, just gross to me that it's not accessible to people with all brains. So there's my email address please. I'm serious. Um, and then here's my telemedicine practice, but you know, I'm not for everybody. So I, I do want people to get care. So email me. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, um, I wanted to comment. Hi, uh, my name is Liana. I'm an autistic therapist in South Seattle. Um, hi. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> If my client has like uh, resources and they're not doing well, I'm a hundred percent like you have to do a body thing in addition to the talk thing you're doing with me. Um, and my client doesn't like, right. I have some clients that are incredibly trapped in poverty or working or caregiving 90 hours a week or whatever. And like nothing is accessible to them. And then I am not mean to them and tell them that they have to do another thing. Right. right. Um, but any client, my just my strong experience of neurodiversity is that it is right. It is like in our bodies and that no, nobody has like sort of ever gotten any body support for it their whole lives. Um, and I tell people, right. Like you can hire a massage therapist. You can go to occupational therapy. You can hire an acupuncturist. Uh, you can go to circus classes. Like I'm really willing to help you find the body thing that is for you, but we aren't going to make the, we aren't going to get to the like feeling that you're trying to get to without addressing your body, especially now that I'm all telemedicine. Um, I will say, uh, I've been in like South Seattle practicing 10 years and the only clients that I've ever see be able to access acupuncture that they felt like fit them are like Asian American clients who've like been in these neighborhoods for four generations. Uh, which they right they just are um maybe able to parse or like understand acupuncture culture um or like what's differing on people's websites or whatever in a way that I am not um but I really hope that changes in our region and I love to hear about your telemedicine practice that's so great thank you I love I I wholeheartedly agree with what you said about something somatic I think that's so awesome that you do that and that you're doing it such an enormously client-centered way go to circus, cl circus class go to silks class do a pole class whatever it is just get in get in the body like it is so so deeply important and you know I think 
if I may just postulate for one moment about, you know, your Asian American clients there, I think there is a way in which I, I'm, because you're saying that they're growing up in predominantly Asian American neighborhoods, there's probably a way in which the idea of pins or needles is like not as threatening because it was probably part of the cultural experience and lexicon. What a and, great point. Yeah. And so, and so like the sensory risk or the prefrontal cortex fear response is just like not as, not as loud. Uh, that's such a great point about the cultural different uh, feeling of woo-woo-ness um, and how that would like affect the client's experience. And I feel like, I mean, are are a lot of the people here, Ellie, in, in uh, Seattle? Looking at the group today, I think we're pretty split, like half and half, in and out. Okay, well, maybe I could... I would be happy to see if I could like identify a few acupuncturists in Seattle who are, you know, neurodiversity competent. It would be, it would be sort of a self-identifying thing. Um, so probably not people that I know personally, but I, I would love, I, I just want this to be more accessible. Yeah. So I could do that if, if you y'all wanted me to. Ooh, someone has a referral for an acupuncturist. Yay. That's awesome. Can you tell me who it is? I would love to connect with them. There are not many of us who work in this way. Um, any other any other questions? Or even if you're like, I don't get what the hell you're talking about. Like I'm <laughs> I'm also I'm up for I'm up for further clarifying if needed. I was wondering if you have some thoughts on the PDA nervous system profile from your lens. Um, that's been a topic that I am trying to learn more about. Mm. From what, from like, what, what in particular, because it's, it's a very broad, what would be most helpful? Hmm. I don't feel like I have my question formulated very well. Um, I have I have been struggling feeling like some of the supports that I've been bringing, um, so a lot of it from like Gottman method um, is not landing well with some parents who have been getting um, some very different ideas about removing demands so that you don't cause damage. Um, and I've been thinking more from like a polyvagal theory of see, navigating where you are in nervous system escalation. Um, but it's, I, I'm learning, it's been a struggle and I'm just wondering how you might support, for example, maybe a kiddo who has had demands removed from their life largely and are at home and really, really struggling um, with lots of triggers throughout the day. Mm, okay, thank you. And thank you so much, Emily, for these people. I'm so excited to, um, to get in touch with them. It's very exciting. Um, love the crowdsourcing. Um, so I, I take a kind of polyvagal approach to many things um and at the risk of sounding a little bit too simplistic i really do think that the the better regulated the nervous system is the better a person's going to do <laughs> um and that includes pda presentations um and so you know i have worked with both Actually, I've worked with more adults who self-identify or have been diagnosed with PDA um, than children, funny enough. Um, and what I have found is that um, a combination of 
herbal medicine. Um, there is herbal medicine that is that supports executive functioning. And we don't exactly know how, <laughs> um, but what I have found, and this is anecdotal, is that for people, autistic folks who um, have PDA and then also some kind of like pain patterning, that there are there are some herbs in the materia medica the chinese materia medica and the western materia medica that when rendered in a formula that acknowledges that acknowledges their pattern addresses their pattern can actually help both with the easing of pain sensation in the body and also with the the sense of um deep overwhelm that can pre Pre, that can come before um, like the some of the PDA um, manifestation. So like it, it basically like helps to keep the keep the nervous system in the window of tolerance. Um so I, that has worked. I've also, the, the, the two people I've, the two adults I've worked with who set either received a PDA diagnosis or, or identified strongly with that pattern. Um, I actually worked with them over telehealth. And so we did utilize, um, phototherapy patches where they were patching them themselves. Um, and then we had kind of like a safety plan patch protocol that they would be able to utilize um, when they were feeling um, that they needed extra support around that. And there's this really cool protocol that um, I learned from one of my teachers who has more of like a neuroacupuncture leaning. Um, and it's it actually works on various parts of the brain um through like through the understanding of like brain like brain area mapping and scalp acupuncture so like we put patches on a hat and the person just wears the hat no one knows they're just wearing a cute hat um and that's worked really well especially in like the in between appointments kind of uh, 